Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, great privilege to be back. I apologize for my absence last week. Uh, of course, I was en route to um, Mayakoba in Cancun with the rest of the Team Kaizen uh, qualifiers, and it was uh, a wonderful, wonderful trip. Uh, to that end, it's obviously given some time for rest and relaxation, of course, but also some time for reflection. And I wanted to share with you some of the lessons that stood out to me this past week, uh, whilst I was sunbathing, uh, eating fine food, um, going for swims in the beautiful warm waters <laughs> of Cancun, spending time with other teammates in, uh, in my Cobra as well. What were some of the things that I learned? And uh, you, you'll be pleased to know, uh, I always like to, when I get certain thoughts or have certain musings, I do like to do a bit of research to see if my thoughts and musings are on track. And so uh, the conclusions that I, I reached, uh, I managed to get some data and evidence of their validity from Harvard Business Review um, on certain studies that they did on this subject uh, that I want to talk about today, which is, what is the real benefit of participating in annual incentives? Uh, I want to start, I'm going to do a bit of a share screen. I know a lot of you have been on Facebook um, this past week. But um, I wanted to, uh, let me see, I think this is the right one. I wanted to share my screen here. Can you see my Facebook screen here? Yeah, you can, excellent. So um, on, I, I was gonna put together a collage and kind of get a PowerPoint presentation together with different pictures and what have you. And I thought actually, uh, Facebook has kind of done that for me <laughs> already. So I just wanted to click through some of these pictures and as I share them, I want you to ask yourself, what is it you're actually seeing in these pictures? Of course, there is a little bit of showing off to do. I deliberately want to create some healthy covetousness and envy um, because we want as many people having this type of experience in Japan next year. Uh, that's what it's all about. But what do you see when you look at this picture here? This is... Uh, a group of us getting together, you've got people from Mexico, uh, from Colombia, and uh, from uh, the US uh, doing a human pyramid on the beach <laughs> at nighttime. Uh, of course, this is uh, Nikki and John Edgel, some UK qualifiers, uh, obviously looking like they're having a lot of fun here. Ben, I don't see your page moving. Are you, you moving? I don't see the page moving. No. Ah, maybe I need to refresh the screen. Okay. Okay. What about now? What do you see now? I, I see your homepage showing with your banner. Oh, that's it. Okay. Well, in that case, it and looks I'm like... And I'm seeing your chats that are PM'd. <laughs> My private message chats. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let me click off there. It looks like my sh screen sharing of Facebook isn't going to work. But... um. Uh, that's that's fine. So everyone has been able to go online anyway. I think there's been an awful lot of chat that's been taking place on Facebook this past week uh, of all these different experiences that people were having in uh, Cancun. Uh, we had the wonderful pleasure of having um, a farewell dinner on the beach, uh, which was fantastic, uh, having such an experience there. Um, of course, there were get-togethers, informal and formal, uh, throughout the course of the visit, but most of the time was spent free uh, with the chance for us to do as we please. Um, many just kind of enjoyed the sunshine, enjoyed the pools, enjoyed the service, uh, which was you know five star service without a doubt. And uh, and of course, there was also a lot of social networking taking place as well. Um, but this got me thinking because there is something in. in uh, yeah, I, I know that there are members of this of this call here today that have all participated in such events in the past. And uh, I, I would ask Rachel, since you just kind of raised your voice just a moment ago, if you want to unmute yourself, you were in Team Kaizen last year and you went to San Francisco. What would you say was the biggest highlight of that trip in San Francisco? Yeah. Uh for me, it was the uh, intimate connecting and really getting to know um, Kurt Foley, mm -hmm. you know, corporate and I don't know, just 
the whole thing was overwhelming. We were so well treated. I felt very honored. I felt extremely appreciated for all the years I've given to Niken and, and haven't um, always gotten that at a platinum level. You know, yeah. I think it came in more at a diamond and a royal diamond when you got more into that intimate group of the president's club. And um, so anyway, those, those for me were certainly highlights of it as well as, I mean, the fun factor is huge, but it isn't about work, yeah. you know, it's just about connecting and celebration and um, vision, you know, more of the vision came out and I, I went away feeling very confident about the corporate path and who's at the helm. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Well, I, you, you, you hit on the very essence of what I wanted to talk about, which is wonderful. Uh, it, it was the intimate um, dialogue, conversations, moments that we were able to share with each other that seemed to really strike a chord for you, uh, which is interesting. And that was something that really struck me, uh, not just in what I got to participate in, but also what I got to observe in regards to the way that others were building their relationships. Now, why do I share this? Um, I share it because at, at a practical level, um, the, the great value that people see in being a member of Team Kaizen, for example, is you get a free trip. Yeah, You get to go to Mayakoba, or for 2018, you'll get to go to Japan. And it's all expenses paid. It's that silver service that Rachel was talking about. It's the treatment that is unparalleled in what you may have experienced ever before. And, um, and that's something to really aspire to and, and to look forward to and to reach for. But there are some deeper levels here that highlight the real underlying critical value of why these types of incentives are so fundamentally, overwhelmingly, critically important. And I want to go back to a, a conversation I had uh, with a friend of mine that uh, I believe was perhaps the most successful network marketer in the United Kingdom ever. Um, at his peak performance of his business, he would host a team event three times a year and would garner between 30 and 40,000 uh, attendees at his event three times a year. This was a team event, yeah? Um, 30 to 40,000. And this is also in the UK, what I like to refer to sometimes as pessimistic Britain, yeah? Uh, people people move to America because it is recognized as a land of opportunity. America creates more millionaires than any other country in the world. Uh, they've got this foundation culturally that they have been built upon as a result of their history that is all about pursuing your dreams, your goals, your aspirations, seeking that independence of what you can become. And uh, But in Great Britain, it can be quite the opposite. We're, we're built on a foundation of monarchies or um yeah monarchies which I, I remember one of our um queens or kings a number of centuries ago uh, once said to one of their confidants if you educate your people you lose your power um and with that mindset <laughs> modern day britain has been built upon and um so why do i say that because this guy built an incredible organization um, in an environment here that um, that, that isn't always hasn't always been entrepreneurially friendly, um, so so I think that's important to note. So how do you get thirty to forty thousand people? Uh, Dave Johnson's putting a little note there, Ben, saying uh, sounds like a great bar to reach, Ben. <laughs> Maybe I need to go for it. Um, but I asked him, and Dave knows a story. What is the real key to achieving great success? in a network marketing business. And without even batting an eyelid, he gave his answer. And he said, it's about creating a club that people want to belong to. Let me say that again. It's about creating a club or a team that people want to belong to. That's interesting that, isn't it? Now, of course, he was the master of doing this type of thing and creating an incredible team environment, an incredible club that had people itching, knocking at the doors to be a part of it. Now, what does this have to do with Cancun? What does this have to do with Japan? In fact, what does it have to do with the Entrepreneur Club? 
what does it have to do with the Paragon Award? What does it have to do with the Pinnacle Prize? Each of these annual incentives. What about the quarterly incentives that we have going on right now? How do these all relate to creating a club that people want to belong to? Let me share with you some science behind this. So a man by the name of Alex Pentland conducted some studies um, a couple of years ago, back in 2012, um, at Harvard. And it was around looking for ways to measure scientifically um, the behaviors or activities that make a team work really well. Uh, and they wanted to get it on a, on a scientific level. So they had this team, uh, this, this study that they conducted at MIT's Human Dynamics Laboratory. Uh, and what they did was they, I guess, as they, as they got this team together, uh, they hooked them up with some electronical uh, equipment to help measure their responses uh, to certain behaviors. And uh, what he said was really interesting. He said they discovered that some things matter much less than what you may think when it comes to building a great team. For example, getting the smartest people. And uh, isn't that interesting? Sometimes we think the, the, the best teams are perhaps the smartest, uh, the most educated, uh, the most highly qualified in regards to skills. Uh, what he identified in the study was actually those things are not what make a team great and what make a team work and what make a team succeed. Here are some things that he identified do make a significant difference. He said they communicate frequently. He said in a typical project team, or does a dozen or so communication exchanges per working hour may turn out to be optimal. Now this is of course, not in an environment like network marketing where we're all spread out uh, working independently. Uh, this is working perhaps in an office environment on a, on a group task. But the point here that he's emphasizing is there is a level of optimum frequent communication that is necessary for a team to work. If we are not communicating on a regular basis with our teams, then behavior and performance starts to decline. So it's really critical. I want you to reflect now at the communication that you have with your team, upline and downline. How frequent is it? How regular is it? What is the nature of it? Does it improve your performance or your team's performance? Um, or are you finding a decline because perhaps you're not connecting quite enough? It says they talk and listen in equal measure. That's interesting, isn't it? That uh, the interaction, the communication that's taking place is both talking and listening, which means it's not just about upline giving instruction, it's also about receiving feedback, letting everyone know that they've got a voice. Uh, it also talked about informal communication being really important. It said the best teams spend about half their time communicating outside of formal meetings or as asides during team meetings and increased opportunities for formal communication, it said tended to lead towards increased team performance. Now with that note being said, I can't help but look at the informal communication that was taking place over this past week in Mayakoba. And it's not just the communication in regards to talking about the business. It was talking about everything else. Is there relevance in sitting down? I had the chance to go out for dinner with Ruth Lowe and her husband um, and, and Julie Tara, uh, one of the nights that we were away. And Ruth had an agenda which she shared with me about what she wanted to talk about while we were having dinner together. And her agenda was this. I just want to get to know you and Kim as a couple. That was it. That was the agenda. It wasn't to talk about business. It was to socialize together and to get better acquainted and to become friends. Um, now, in a team environment, of course, it was a wonderful evening. <laughs> Let me emphasize that. Fantastic night together. I got to learn a lot about her and her husband, and it was just a thrill to spend the time together. But what does that do emotionally to the connectedness that we feel as teammates now? What is the knock-on effect that that has when we start to have informal communication versus just the formal stuff? It also talked about the need to explore ideas and information outside of the group. Um, so periodically connect with different sources 
and come back and see what we can learn from them so that we don't become so insular um, because sometimes there are great ideas going on outside of us that we can connect with and then integrate into our activity. Now, this is what he said as a result of his study. Uh, first of all, what you'll notice in the points that I highlighted about what makes a team great didn't talk about skill set, didn't talk about tenure, uh, how long they've been performing in the team environment or on a particular project. Uh, it didn't talk about um, uh, ranks, for example. It didn't talk necessarily about um, specific set behaviors. What it did talk about was communication. Each one of those points was related to communicating. But here's what he said. He said, you'll notice that none of the factors outlined above concern the substance of a team's communication. Meaning, he didn't identify what specifically they were talking about. He said their badges could only capture how people communicate, tone of voice, gesticulation, how one faces others in a group, and how much people talk and, li uh, and listen. He said they do not capture what people communicate. He said, now this is very purposeful. He said he recognized that it wasn't so much about what they were communicating on, but how they communicated that made the difference. And he said this, let me just read this out. He said, my hypothesis was that the ancient biological patterns of signaling that human developed in the millennia before we came to language, uh, which is a relatively recent development, still dominate our communication. He said he was buoyed by this idea by research on just how sophisticated nonverbal communication can be across the animal kingdom. For example, bees use a marvelous system of dancing competitions to decide where to get their pollen. He said, according to our data, it is as true for humans as it is for bees. How we communicate turns out to be the most important predictor of team success and as important as all other factors combined, including intelligence, personality, skill, and the content of discussion. He said the old adage that it's not what you say, but how you say it, turns out to be mathematically correct. Let me restate this. How we communicate, how we communicate, turns out to be the most important predictor of team success and as important as all other factors combined, including intelligence, personality, skill, and the content of discussion. I'm not sure about you, but for me, that blows my mind. How we communicate is the single most important factor in developing team success. So with that being said, sometimes we might look at a certain presentation and say, well, this is really important. If we could just use this word or that word, then it would really make a difference. If you want to change this word or that word, that's fine. Because in the context of reality, in the context of science, it's not what you say, but how you say it that has the overarching impact on the people we work with. What does this also mean for these events, this trip away that I got to enjoy? What it means is for five days, we got to communicate together, interact verbally and non-verbally, um, where we could just spend time, have fun, relax, and create memories together. All of that, even though it is a memory versus a business conversation, those experiences, those moments, bind us together and create a different relationship that creates something of significance. The farewell party that we had uh, on the Friday night uh, was just something that was, to me, uh, something definitely to be remembered. Um, dinner on the beach, they had literally silver service on the front. We're sitting on chairs that are sitting on sand. Uh, you can hear the ocean lapping just a few feet from your, from your, your chair. And we're having this, wonderful, um, having this wonderful meal together. Uh, and as a consequence of this experience, we had dancing, they had a DJ playing, dancing was going on. Um, of course, with a lot of Latin Americans, there was high energy when it came to the dancing and the music and what have you. Uh, and it was just a lot of fun. And that fun just connected people in a way that webinars can't. Um, and that fun 
connected us in a way that really just highlighted why these events are so critically important. Um, let me just read, Rachel Dayton said, this is why Orlando and San Antonio and the Eagle Expo are so important. It, for me, has been where all my Nikan family networking and making friends began. That's really true, Rachel. Uh, this is why we have this necessity for coming together in person uh, at big events. It does something for us. It, it connects us and gets us all be, uh, kind of moving to the same beat of the same drum, which I think is really, really important. From another practical perspective, of course, I want to ask another question. Is it worthwhile qualifying for an annual incentive alone? I know some of us are talking with our team saying, let's do this together. But how many of us are actually just quietly doing it by ourselves? Where's the, where, you know, of course, there is value in going because you can connect with others. Yeah. But what would be the difference in going there and connecting with others, having that great experience, feeling connected with the company, feeling connected with people cross line to you? That's great. But what would be the impact if you went to Japan as a Team Kaizen member with half a dozen or a dozen members of your team? And you got to sit around a dinner table together and socialize, uh, sit by a swimming pool and have drinks, walk through um, a beautiful Japanese garden with all of its cherry trees and its, its um, pink and white blossoms and its water gardens. Uh, what would it do to walk through a serene environment like that and sit together and reflect and just absorb and be in the moment and share that sacred experience together? What would that do for your teams when you come back? From that event, how would you build your business? I want you to reflect for a minute. What would you do differently coming back from that type of experience with your teammates? How do you think that would affect the way that you work together? So what we see here is something really, really important. It's not what we communicate. It's how we communicate. And when we spend time together in the annual incentives, the unspoken messages are more important than everything else combined. Beginning with an entrepreneur club, when we do that together, we work as a team there, don't we? We have an ABC methodology for an entrepreneur club. Uh, what is the unspoken messages that will happen there? Because amongst all of the dialogue where you're doing your ABCs, where you're speaking to prospects and what have you, there is an awful lot of unwritten communication, unspoken communication that takes place. Um, a message such as, I've got your back. I want you to succeed. We're doing this together. Um, I want you to achieve your goals. We're going to win together. All of these types of messages come through unspoken, but with power because it's backed up by action. What about if you work with someone to get them qualifying for a Paragon Award and they rank advanced to gold? What happens in that unspoken interaction that takes place with all of the social interactions that go around this? Because of course, helping someone get to that rank, you, you cannot get there without having those asides that we were talking about before. That dialogue that happens outside of the formal meetings. There's all of the outside stuff that happens when you're building together that really makes a difference. I wanna emphasize you know, the, the, the conversations that Mike DiMuccio and I have had of late have been really interesting. And Mike, I know you're on the call. Maybe you might want to just unmute yourself for just a minute and highlight this yourself, one of your, what, one of your thoughts. But as we've kind of planned together this, this wellness, this world tour, it's necessitated a lot of conversation and discussion. Can you hear me, Mike? I can. I'm just in the worst part of my drive here. That's... No, 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 no worries. <laughs> but you, you, you'll relate to this anyway because this has been a shared experience. But... But of necessity, we've had a lot of business conversation, um, but we've also had the chance to walk the streets of Mexico City together and just chat and talk. We've climbed to the top of a, an Aztec pyramid uh, as a result of doing business together and sat there on the top of that wonderful um, historic monument uh, and shared sacred moments together. But this is what's happened as a consequence. Um, we've had a number of recent episodes where Mike has said to me via WhatsApp, quick question, Ben, 
we're about to do X, Y, and Z. What are your thoughts? And I've picked it up just a little bit too late. And he's had the meeting and is needed to go in to, with it for a particular point without getting my input. And then I've given my input, but of course, it's that moment too late. And he's responded and said, you know, great feedback, missed it, it was a little bit too late, but you wouldn't believe it, that's exactly what I did. Yeah, and haven't we had that happen a number of times, Mike, where yeah. you, know, you said to me, what should, I, what should we do here? And I've said to you, Mike, well, what do you reckon, should we do this? Or well, we've come together at exactly the same moment to say, I was just thinking, we need to do this. Oh my goodness, <laughs> we're doing the same thing, talking the same language. And, and there's a real buzz that comes with that, but that happens as a consequence of all the other stuff that goes together. Uh, it gets you aligned and it gets you focused in such a way that it creates a very strong bond that helps you to succeed as a team better than anything else. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting to the end. Any, any thoughts on that, Mike? It looks like you've stopped. Uh, no, it, I, I just, exactly what you said. It's um, when you're on the same page with somebody or a group of people, you feel like you're, you're never alone. You're in it together. and not only that, but it's really reinforcing when you are thinking along the same lines, because then you know that your intuition about something is on point. Um, you feel connected to to the the whole concept. So um, I think, in, fa in fact, uh, Ben, for me, this phase of my Nikon career is quite different than the previous phase. This phase is really about team for me. Mm. Um, I've sort of kind of been the Lone Ranger in building my business, ironically, for a long, long time, sort of on the outside in. And now it feels like I'm part of a team and, uh, and this team has expanded to include a lot of others who are on this call. So I'm yeah. pretty excited about that. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And to me, it's the team stuff that makes it really rewarding and really fun. You know, it makes the journey enjoyable. So, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, here's my closing thought. That the, the power of that trip that I got to enjoy last week with the other Team Kaizen members uh, was not rooted in the location as glorious and luxurious as it was. Uh, it wasn't centered in the fact that it was free, though that was a wonderful perk and privilege. Um, it was centered in the fact that it gave us the chance to communicate socially, informally, um, for hours on end, in a way that could bind and create messages that really foster success more than any other thing. And like I said, I just want to recommit, uh, restate that message. How we communicate is more important than what we communicate. And it is more important collectively than every other skill, including um, intelligence and ability, all of those other things combined. How we communicate is what matters most. So with that in mind, as we get to the end of this call, I want you to think about the opportunities that you've got this week, this month, to communicate with your team. What are you communicating? Is typically what we tend to ask ourselves. But I want, to ask you, I want you to ask yourself, how am I communicating it? Um, what is my delivery message? What is my, my method? How am I doing this? Um, that to me is really what we need to consider. I hope everyone on this call has tickets to Orlando. Why? Because all of the stuff in between what's being said on stage will actually be the most important parts of the event. The chance to network together, to be together. And, and interestingly, I've deliberately given time in the schedule where we have time out from being in a room, listening to people on stage, where we can socialize, interact, and have all of that um, informal dialogue and interaction to make full use of what this event can really do for us. So that this, this lesson that we've learned today wonderfully is integrated into the format and schedule of Orlando. Um, so I think we're going to have a fantastic opportunity to be together there. So please, if you haven't booked your tickets, do. There are going to be people from everywhere coming together. Um, and of course, with this instruction that we've got, we can bind our teams, make them really strong, unbreakable, uh, and a force to be reckoned with as we move together knowing that how we communicate is really what matters most. So if you're brand new, don't get too concerned about the words you use. Just express your message with confidence and enthusiasm. Do it with conviction. And if you fumble and stumble over your words, if they kind of feel like they're falling out of your mouth, you know what? If you're saying it with love and enthusiasm and sincerity, turns out 
that you're better off. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great week and we'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye.